everyone, Pinar and Apple here with the newest addition to the Sonic Cinematic Universe, Knuckles. The Sonic movies were a breath of fresh air and have come in the wave of great to decent video game movies, arguably started by the appearance of Detective Pikachu. Since before then we were given far more well-known stinkers per capita, from many series including Hitman, Resident Evil, Street Fighter and Doom. But the Sonic movies really impressed me, especially with the improvements they made visually, the way they slowly introduced core concepts of the games, and of course, Jim Carrey. In a sequentially ranked hierarchy based on level of critical importance, the disparity between us is too vast to quantify. Agent Stone, the doctor thinks you're basic. Knuckles, while similar, is quite different, visually, comedically, and tonally as a whole. And I feel it will certainly appeal to less people than the movies did. The show is far more comedic, heartfelt, and Jewish than the movies. And while it has clear bits of quality, it does have its issues. Meaning, if you can't get into any aspect of it, you probably won't appreciate any of it. As shown with people on YouTube and Twitter talking about it as if it skinned their cat and fed it to them. But while I loved bits of it, I still was able to notice and get frustratingly bored with parts. So let's analyse those bits that really made me laugh, and the problems I have with the show. So we start off with a pretty basic training montage, with nice game references, and it starts the trend of having most of the noticeable soundtrack be rocky 80-90s type songs. If not literally, then being in the same genre. And we can see the CGI characters are as good as ever, seriously. With the exclusion of a couple shots here and there, Knuckles looks great for the majority of the show. Sonic gives us a good recap of the second movie with madness, and it's good to have this here, since this is a cameo episode. Seriously, past this episode is not a major problem for now, but looking at the press, there were mentions that this show has been made to excuse Knuckles from parts of Sonic 3. They could be rumours, but if they do turn out to be true, it would be an explainable absence for Knuckles and Wade. Which may track, considering that Pretzel Lady, Sonic and Tails only appear in this episode, and not at the end of the series. And James Marsden doesn't even show up. And sure, we don't need them in the rest of the show, but considering how much screen time they get in the first episode to set up Knuckles' journey, Paired up with these rumours, it does feel a little strange, but we'll just have to hold off and wait till we get a trailer for Sonic 3 to see if Knuckles plays a big part in it, which I'm hoping he does. But enough with rumours, let's get back to the story. Their home life montage is fun, and Knuckles sees some construction workers. Thinking them attackers, he defends the house from them in a funny fashion, causing them to give the obvious reaction of running away, much to Maddie's dismay. If there's something I remember liking about this and the other movies, especially in Knuckles' case, is the fish-out-of-water comedy. It works quite well with Knuckles, maybe better than with Sonic, but I was surprised in the show's ability to entertain me so much with good writing paired with Idris Elba's performance, considering I usually really don't like the fish-out-of-water trope that much. Knuckles doesn't understand what he did wrong, and Maddie leaves it to Sonic and Tails, played again by Ben Schwartz and Kalina Shaughnessy, who do well with what they're given. Knuckles gets some nice moments with returning best boy Ozzy, and Sonic with some nice comedy attempts to get the red guy to calm down, making himself at home, which goes so well that he gets grounded. Get down right now. You are grounded! I have no idea what that means. Yeah, I know I said the fish out of water is good, you just gotta wait till Knuckles gets on his adventure. We hop over to Wade, played by Adam Pally, and Jack Sinclair, bounty hunter extraordinaire, played by Julian Barrett, as they train for the upcoming bowling tournament in Reno, but Wade is just as kinda pathetic as he was in the other films. But although not completely toned down, much like the fish out of water stuff, this brand of jokes expand from the films and are much better used here, when usually this secondhand embarrassment style would annoy me. And other characters using it in this do, but for Wade, I was pleasantly surprised how much I enjoyed him. But Jack doesn't share my enthusiasm as Wade is kicked off the team and replaced by rich girl scout Susie Barnes, played by Alice Tregoning, who is funny for the few lines she gets, including when she verbally thrashes him. You are an excellent You're gonna choke, loser! 
Is it strange for the main plot of the Knuckles series to rely on bowling? Yes. So is the episode about Judaism and the wacky character performances, but the silliness really works. Unless you have no concept of fun, then I just pity you. Jack is a little much of a character. One of many in this show that feel ripped straight from a cartoon, like the Fat Albert movie. But that makes this smarmy ass hat really enjoyable to watch. Sonic can't help Knuckles get any more peace, but he is visited by the spirit of Pachakamak, played by Christopher Lloyd, and... Yeah, I love Christopher Lloyd, but I just didn't feel his performance as well as I usually do in this episode. But to be fair, the dude's 85. He can have an off day. Even if it makes me weep. But I'm sure there are many people who enjoyed it, and I do like his performance later. It's just this scene specifically I didn't seem to gel with. Pachakamak strangely tells Knuckles to train Wade as a warrior, so he can win the bowling tournament. With a funny newspaper image of him to accompany it. And with the arcane message delivered, he floats away. Knuckles recruits Wade with a nice scene between the two. Help! Help! Wade Whipple, this is no time for lying down. And I like how easily they get along right away, with the other able to interpret the other's point of view quite easily. Wade and Knuckles leave town with a funny reiteration of a previous joke. In doing so, they alert a duo of corrupt gun agents. Mason, literally the musician Kid Cootie, and Willoughby, played by Ellie Taylor, who looks like the bad end for Kelly Jones. These two are more just basically cartoon villains who sometimes get too carried away and act like Family Guy characters. They can be funny, but sometimes they do go on a little too long, or start to become too caricature as they kick what must be the face of institutional nepotism to the Mushroom Planet before he can narc. Enjoy! <laughs> You're pretty proud of yourself for someone who just kicked an unsuspecting man in the chest. Yeah, I am. These two evil men in black lead us to introducing the other main villain. One who could be cool, but sucks so much in execution, the buyer, played by Rory McCann. Who is so evil he built a lot of Eggman's tech and has a large supply of Knuckles' powerful quills but is running out, trading his tech to the agents so they can harvest Knuckles' quills for him, now that the Echidna is isolated from the other aliens. This whole wrapping up loose ends from Eggman could work, but yeah, this guy's wasted and amounts to bad guy telling other bad guys what to do before the show suddenly pulls him out of its ass to be the main antagonist. Knuckles just ravages some grapes, hashtag relatable, and Wade takes him to experience a bowling alley. The beginning of their bonding is fun, and the story of Wade's dad leaving him at a TJ Maxx is chekhov well, paired with a great performance, but the action starts as Kid Coody and Willoughby invade, Wade becoming just kind of fucking useless, although still kind of funny. And here is a clear example of a scene going from great to average as Cootie gets a great line just for them to point out how it makes little sense and he just wanted to sound cool, blah blah. It just doesn't work the way they want it to. The same way the cop Wade being so pathetic just doesn't really work that well in such a high stakes situation like this. But the action is pretty great. By the end they use a pretty creative invention, a ring gun, and manage to trap Knuckles, forgetting about Wade, as the two agents continue to almost be funny, and just let the scene slip from them. So yeah, a decent start, but the show's most glaring issues I feel are clear from the start, just like the great aspects of the characters. We'll just have to see which outweighs which by the end. So our agent friends bring Knuckles to an abandoned reference of a ski resort, Awaiting the arrival of the buyer as Wade scopes the place out, and yeah, this is probably the episode that I enjoyed the least. A large amount of focus is on Wade, and this seems to be the episode where they try as hard as they can to work through the bad aspects of his comedy. With a technically first look at pretty inventive opening credits, Knuckles wakes up in the resort, and even with the limited range he can give while trapped in a box, he does get a fair amount of laughs. And good moments with the agents. Wade has found one of the powered gauntlet weapons, and fantasies a plan. Wade's fantasy is pretty fun, with a lot of good gags and acting, 
but goes on entirely too long. When it's clear from the start, the joke is that the plan will simply not turn out as he fantasizes. To a ridiculous degree. Seriously, I've summed up eight minutes of the episode in two paragraphs thanks to this. Willoughby has a nice tete-a-tete with Knuckles. And with such a comedic and slapstick character, she does get to be far more intimidating than Cootie from Presence Alone. But I also find it funny that we spend so long on her giving the I promise you know nothing about me. But when this is all over, you will. Type speeches, we don't really learn more about her. Below the surface level, and certainly not from Knuckles' perspective. Most from her own or the buyers. Wade is ready to start his plan with his supplies and power gauntlets, but just can't stop the stupid secondhand embarrassment. Only alerting the agents to his arrival and getting himself stuck inside to fight Cootie, as his car implodes and the gauntlets throw him around. Cootie tries his best to be both funny and intimidating, and sure, gets some funny moments and clearly has fun just destroying Wade. Seriously, I have no idea how he tanks these hits, but the scene has good action and some good laughs, like Cootie having to stop and call his mother mid-battle. Wade plays dirty and pretty impressively gets the upper hand on Cootie, knocking him out. Wade manages to save Knuckles by clinging to him as he blows up the cage. Knuckles giving a look like a pony about to be put in a jar. And to escape with some decent CGI, they reference E.T. and Knuckles' gliding ability. Gliding from the resort to a road down below, before stealing a car and getting a meal at a burger shack nearby. I only eat grapes. And Cool Ranch Doritos. Okay, well that explains your insane and erratic behavior. Wade and Knuckles have a pretty good conversation, once again comparing their worldviews, Wade letting Knuckles see the best of the situation, but meanwhile the agents wake up, anxious that there is no way out of the game when it comes to the buyer, which is a pretty good motivation for them, needing to get Knuckles back before the dealer gets them. Knuckles admits now that his goal of protecting the Emerald is on the back burner, and he is looking for a place to call home, as he finds commonality with Wade in the betrayals perpetrated against them. And with a second wind, they hit the road, only for the episode to end, with the reveal a bounty has been put on Wade, coming from just the most assholey radio presenter. So Wade goes to the only safe place he knows, home, where his mum fates at the side of him. So episode 3 starts where we left off, but for some reason Wade's mum doesn't faint? It's like when they use CGI to edit a trailer so that you don't get large spoilers, except this time it served no purpose. I suppose they just really wanted to use the blooper where Stockard Channing saw Adam Pally for the first time and was just so shocked there wasn't a meter tall superpowered echidna in his place. So this is Wendy Whipple, who is just a darling. And then there is Wade's sister Wanda, played by Edi Patterson, who is just the opposite of the mum, an FBI agent who gets some laughs but otherwise is just the whiniest bitch and routinely turns Wade into a similar whiny bitch. Sure, sometimes the dynamic pays off well, but all the other times, they're just obnoxious. And that's not a negative on the performance itself. She does fine, it's just what she's given is mostly shit. Wade introduces Knuckles to his family, or as his mother says, Knuckles. Knuckles. Well, that's what I said, Knuckles. You're not Did saying that. Wade? You're making like a Wade? CH sound, Wade? and you're saying huh Yeah, it's weird. It's like, Knuckles. it's not like- And Wendy finally gets to do the faint. She's okay quite soon after, and she takes an instant shine to Knuckles, as Wanda gets close to sexually violating him. Wade? Wade? Yeah, that was kind of uncomfortable, not just to see, but for me to say that. Wendy is respected by Knuckles for a Shabbat dinner, giving us some ridiculous flashbacks of the hell that was the previous Whipple family Shabbat dinners. And while I know little about the Jewish, this episode does introduce the audience to a few concepts that I found interesting, like the Shabbat dinner with its candles and strange allusions to the Holocaust, and apparently the watching of Julia Roberts movies. Wendy dubs Knuckles, the alien echidna, is basically Jewish. I'm not sure if that's how it works, but the dinner commences and it looks delicious. 
Knuckles and Wendy work really well off each other with a nice payoff of the whole grapes thing. But Wanda is insufferable, and although she gets some funny lines while debating the existence of the military organisation called Gun, which we've seen in the games and the previous movie, the dynamic is not my cup of tea at all. So after some Gevilta fish, Hala bread, and Wendy being relatable, Wade gets stabbed, so retreats to his room as Wendy despairs their shitty family. This leaves Knuckles alone, feeling as if she might prey on him. At least I'm not all alone this time. And it seems Wade's bounty is going around as a group sets out to find him, somehow guessing he's the type to run home. Knuckles tries to console Wade, and we get to see a first look at his father from a slight distance. And once again, their dynamic works quite well as Wade attempts to work through his feelings. He tries to get Knuckles a favourite song, a nice step towards Knuckles settling down on Earth. It gets strange though when Knuckles finds a cardboard cutout of Zap that Wade apparently used to cuddle. But you know, at least it's not Celine Dion. Wendy compares Jewish trauma with Knuckles' own as they watch a Julia Roberts movie and a gang of hoodlums advance on the house. Wade being attacked first and Knuckles taking the guy on, blowing him away. The next is Wanda, who, for an FBI agent, also has to be saved by Knuckles, but not before some decent blocking and some comedy of the same calibre. But while pretty incompetent, we at least see Wanda isn't just a whiny bitch and actually has a little bit of situational awareness. Then comes the best fight scene, Knuckles and Wendy protecting the still-burning Shabbat candles with a good rotating camera and musical score. The only downside being the CGI masking Wendy's face is a bit noticeably shit in parts. But it is badass, and the family come together again to see the candles run their course. And the credits play to all the small things. Might be my favourite episode, honestly. Although it may not be the best by the end of it, but I'm pinning my hopes here. And now that we know the whole Whipple family, it's nice to see that all three of their names start with W, while the father that left is named Pete. That's some nice meta text. Episode 4 starts off quite happy, like sitcom happy, and Wade just starts having the best day, even as shit is falling apart around him. But that ends when, in a pretty funny and well done stunt, Wade is dragged away, in what would be a lot more painful in real life than it's shown here, as Knuckles is resolute in his thinking that Wade will be just fine, because Wade needs to figure out how to save himself on his own. Wade's attacker ends up being Jack again, with a great comedic presence, and Knuckles over yay hat. I will never stop talking about how happy I am Knuckles hat makes it into this show. Except for now, so we can continue the episode. So as bounty hunter Jack is of course here to collect, sticking Wade in a little carnival cage he got from Facebook Marketplace, while he rides in style in Susie's family limo, all the way to the Reno tournament. Jack continues to be funny, both in his interactions with Wade and as he scares the shit out of Susie's parents. Do you believe in heaven above? Do you believe in love? Take it, Susie's dad! Knuckles calls Wade somehow, but refuses to help, but does guide him on how to trance to the ancestral plane. After some shocking from Jack, Wade wakes up in the bowling alley, met by Pachakamak who I like a lot more in this episode than the first. Meaning I might be right when I said the first episode was an off day for Christopher Lloyd. Pacha Kamak is here to teach Wade, and this episode becomes a great musical number. And man, this fucking rules. The song itself has many layers and is funny throughout, but the performances and the sheer effort put into keeping this as a sort of stage musical style are fantastic. I cannot describe the feeling I had watching it for the first time, as I tried desperately to keep my jaw off the floor so I could keep laughing. But I can't just go on and on about how much I love it. What are the good aspects of this performance? Well, the singer of most of it is Jack, dressed up as an owl, as Knuckles' enemy. Jack is shot perfectly, and the choreography otherwise is great. And I like the song probably more than I should. 
Knuckles' dad is shown as a puppet as he dies, and there is other puppetry here, like this big fire demon that Knuckles slash Wade must face, looking like Iblis or some shit. And it's pretty solid, approaching top tier Jim Henson puppetry. As Michael Bolton comes in, we get a fantastic recreation of the games. A lot of effort put into the design, but personally I'm not too sure of the demon's voice. Wade just kind of walks out of there, leaving too early with the wrong lesson. So of course, he ends up back in the spirit world for Act 2, where the demon's voice works a little better, and we get a few more great gags as Wade learns the usual lesson of listening to the heart. Which allows Wade to just sort of gain superpowers for a sec and fly out of the cage. Wade does all he can, standing there in his dressing gown, and challenges Jack to a duel. The duel is sort of a joust, with Jack on his bike and Wade left with a child's bike, as they recycle the distance joke from Shazam. This is fucking stupid, but it actually works pretty well, as the local mailman happens to have a flair to start the duel off, and somehow Jack is just so intimidated he loses his cool. Don't know how, but he wipes out and loses his ponytail to Wade. Looking for this? My locks. My beautiful locks. What have you done to me? Susie's mum asks Wade to finish Jack off, and I'm just realising I probably shouldn't have put those two words together in this script. But instead, half strips Jack and sends him running. Wade comes home victorious to the adoring eyes of Knuckles and his family, and they take off into the sunset. Heading for Reno, as Send Me an Angel plays. So they make it to Reno, which looks more like movie Las Vegas, but to be fair, I've never been there so I can't judge. America is a strange and foreign land. They enter the bowling stadium, which also is filled with pokies like a casino, and after some strange Kevin James mentions, they run into the family. Well, well, well. Look who it is. We literally planned to meet here at this exact time. It's not at all surprising. Wendy wants to get a massage with Knuckles, and Wanda continues to remind me of the parody of the girl from Juno from Disaster Movie. Fuck, that's a deep cut. Wade sees his dad, who is just such a douche, but is still entertaining to watch, played by the well-known comedy actor Carrie Elwes who gets a fun smarmy montage to Robbie Williams' Let Me Entertain You. This gives Wade his opportunity to reunite, and we get that trope where he tries to repeat what the other person says, and I find it just as uncomfortable as I usually do, but Pete seems to just run with it. Knuckles gets a strange interaction with a mascot creature, allowing Wade to just speak from his heart. And although it's easy to predict he'll end up being an arsehole, Pete's performance does allow enough of the fickle care he has for his son to come through, to make it feel possibly genuine. Meanwhile, our agent friends aren't having nearly as much fun as they're brought before the buyer, who isn't too happy with them, but is quite intimidating, even as Cootie attempts to make jokes that don't really land. The buyer exposits his backstory, working for Gunn but being washed when Robotnik was thrown out, surviving assassination teams, and Willoughby finds common ground with him. In a very basic monologue, but the scene serves its purpose as she makes some decent points. But it is strange that she compares her being put behind a desk to this guy going through attempted assassinations. He does the creepy stalk towards them but then lets them go thing, and allows them a second chance needing Knuckles for their lives, as he wants the power for his latest creation. But it's weird, because if his latest creation ends up being the robot he uses to fight in the finale, as it would usually be narrative-wise, how does he power it for the final fight next episode? So that he can fight Knuckles to get Knuckles' power, when he already doesn't have enough of Knuckles' power to use the machine. That's probably what the show's biggest gripe is, plot holes. We meet the commentators of the bowling tournament, Rob Hubel playing Dylan Beagleton, and Paul Shear playing Gary St. Clair III Esquire. What a mouthful. These two are fine, they get some good laughs, but are wholly uninteresting. The bowling tournament starts as Push It To The Limit plays, and we get a pretty sweet montage sequence. As Wade is suddenly still playing with Susie, and Pete has a pretty funny ball. 
The whole thing is accompanied with some really creative editing as they play and teams get eliminated, allowing Wade and Pete to confront each other in the finals. The bowling will continue later, so Pete and Wade spend time together. Which, much like before, is half awkward and half charming. Wade asks why Pete left, and he just tells him he wanted to find himself in the bowling world, when he should have been doing it with his family. With the nice added detail of their shared music mixes, I didn't believe he was good for a second, but the great acting between the two did keep me second guessing. Wendy comes to give Wade his old bowling ball, and with a great careful performance, tries to get Wade to keep his guard up, as she remembers how hard and shitty it was for Pete to leave them, and she worries if he gets too close, it might happen again. But of course, Wade isn't having any of it, but honestly, this scene between the two is really good. And I've seen plenty of scenes like it in other programs where one gets angry at the other or something else. For them to fight, only for the naysayer to be proven right anyway. But in this, they just have a plain candid discussion between the two, respecting each other's opinions. Darling, just be careful. Your father's great at convincing people to love him. And that's usually when he decides to leave. She wishes him luck, but is abducted by Agent Cootie. So while Wade spends time with Pete in his penthouse, it's revealed pretty quickly that Pete betrayed them, as the agents hold his family hostage, in exchange for Knuckles. Once again, the interaction between Wade and Pete is good, even better when Wendy gets involved. You've never supported me, not fully. Oh, oh, really? Oh, God, you are such a psycho schmuck. Pete makes sure they know he will help them after, but Agent Cootie makes sure they know it was actually his idea to abduct the family. Yeah, fuck this guy. He even tries to use it as leverage to get Wade to drop out of the tournament so he can't beat him. Willoughby tries to threaten Wanda, but like me, Wade doesn't give a shit. But Wade is forced to get Knuckles as she then threatens Wendy. They make him stay on a call as he lures Knuckles out and sends him up. The agent's waiting for him. It's a good cliffhanger considering we don't know that Wade has a plan, but once the plan is revealed next episode, I don't think it's possible for Wade to have slipped Knuckles the AirPod to get him listening in on the plan. So, a bit of a lapse in script to film there. So the resolution of the cliffhanger, as I said, Knuckles was apparently listening in on the call. However that works, and the agents immediately open fire once the elevator arrives, but Knuckles is a step ahead, apparently stealing the mascot costume from before. I don't know, just fucking summoning it from converting air molecules into fabric or something, and hiding above, striking once the agents got close. Pretty much the only Elton John song that they use for fight scenes plays, and while not as stylistic as the fight in the bowling alley, it's pretty good and has a nice couple of gags. And while they fight, Wade saves Wanda and Wendy, only to get more annoying bickering. But to be fair, it is funnier than these types of scenes before because we get to see Wanda in pain. Agent Cootie is pumped, but Willoughby whips out the ring gun. With a punch from Knuckles, sending the portal rings across the room, creating a fucking mega infinity portal. Like when you place portals above and below you in guess which game, portal. The agents get trapped in the portal tunnel as it becomes a singularity. And I guess they will just never escape. Forever trapped in that golden tunnel, doomed to starve and dehydrate to death. Wow, this show got dark. Allusions to the Holocaust, sexual exploitation of echidnas, and now this. Knuckles reminds Wade he must beat his schmuck of a father. So after some cringing supplied by Wanda, a strange cut to black takes us to the battleground known as the Bowling Lanes. Pete believes he's already won and makes sure everyone knows about it. Such a douche. But after a glare from Susie and the commentators sucking on Pete's dick and doing to TJ Maxx what the Sonic movies did for the Olive Garden, Wade turns up. Pistol Pete's long lost son. <laughs> what? Allegedly. And after a strange positioning joke, Pete postures a little more, Wade strips, and after a shot of Susie's happiness, the tournament continues. Wade plays fantastically while Knuckles asks the staff for some hala bread. And we get another less creative montage of our players celebrating their great throws. Knuckles manages to get his hala bread, which, I mean, do hotels just have 
staple Jewish food on tap? I, do, I don't know. I don't know. I've never been to Reno. For all I know, Reno has a very large Jewish population. I, I couldn't tell you. But Knuckles follows Screams outside, only to be literally roped into battle with the buyer and his super mech. And while the design is fine, and the fight looks good for the most part, the CGI putting the hound, I mean, the buyer, into the robot doesn't look the best. With another weird feeling cut to black, we head back to the tournament, it ending with a pretty clever callback to the first episode. Pete making the failing shot that Wade did in the first episode, but this time, Wade chews him out with some nice endearment of both Knuckles and Wendy, and he strikes him out, succeeding where he failed at the beginning of the show. Wait, is this show called Knuckles or Wade? Oh, oh there he is. There he is! So Knuckles is thrown into the lanes, making the attendees flee, and Wade head into battle on a set I can't tell is a real street or CGI. The way the background is shot just doesn't gel with my eyes. The buyer sucks up Knuckles' power, basically becoming the ending of Sonic 1, and Wade stands up to the buyer. But Wendy comes in clutch, having stolen this weird bowling car, delivering the super gloves Cootie left. So, like a boss, Wade starts tossing bowling balls at the super buyer as we get a montage of Wade and Knuckles and all they've learnt on their journey. Cliché, but heartful enough, closing Knuckles' story arc. To get Knuckles up and at him, ready to save Wade and kick the buyer's ass, Drawing his power back, and with a sick tune playing off the whole musical number thing from episode 4, he drops the stadium's ball on the villain. We see the commentators for one last time getting a decent laugh, and as Pete tries to run off with the trophy, he's stopped epically by Wendy. Although breaking the trophy, even if it's fixed by the time they head home, in the post credits, giving us a payoff to the credit music, as Knuckles finds his jam. A much better ending after the credits as before the episode ended on a freeze frame and jump. A decent ending as we do get character payoffs and arc completions, but it feels really strange that this doesn't end with them back in Green Hills. So that was Knuckles. And overall, I don't get why people seem to so vehemently hate it. Sure, it does have issues. There are characters like Wanda who are almost never pleasant to watch. It spends less time with Knuckles on his own than with Wade. But when the two are together, they work well off each other. So maybe people would have felt better if it was called Knuckles and Wade or something. But Wade was made a fun enough character, but given depth he didn't have before, making his inclusion entertaining to watch. And his family drama was done quite well, even if, yes, it is strange a lot more focus was put on it than Knuckles. But considering Knuckles' whole thing is finding a place to feel at home, it does make sense why they took this direction, attempting to create a dynamic between these two, like with Sonic and Donut Lord, but using the longer runtime to establish Wade's backstory, as we already got a lot of Knuckles in the last movie, whereas Wade only got glorified cameos in both. There were some really interesting sets, such as the bowling alley used in episode 1, and for the fantastic musical sequence in episode 4, plus the interiors of the Reno Casino, and the buyer's grungy mechanic shed looked great. Speaking of the buyer, he was probably the worst villain of the main four. Sure, he had a good presence and Rory McCann did what he could with the material, but he gets little interaction with the main characters, and his fight as the climax was underwhelming, even if it paid off the character interactions well. The other villains, Cootie and Willoughby, were fun, goofy, and had a good screen presence, but you can't take them too seriously. They are a goofy, cartoony, Team Rocket-like bunch, but that doesn't mean they aren't intimidating or dangerous. But if you're expecting them to be as impressive as Robotnik, you're shit out of luck. But these two Jesse and James asses are still entertaining. Kid Cootie clearly having fun, and Ellie Taylor putting the effort in, even if her character was averagely written. The other side characters are pretty good. Jack gave a fantastic and light-hearted performance for the villain he was, and Carrie Elwes was fantastic too. So while this show isn't the best critically, it has problems, I'd have to rate it a subjective 8 out of 10 from my heart for pure enjoyment, but on the base objective quality, I'd had to recommend it as a 7 or 6.5 out of 10. But bar a few moments, I was pretty happy with what we got, even if it could have been better. 
Thank you everybody so much for watching my review of The Knuckles Show. Please like the video if you liked it, comment down below if you wish, or if you have something that you want me to check out, and consider subscribing to the channel, and if you do, ring that notification bell so that you're told every single time that I make an upload. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next review. Bye! Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages with writing on the side.